Well, hi everyone, welcome back to Photoshop User TV. We are brought to you by Kelby One, who bring you, among many things, Photoshop User Magazine. There it is. Ooh. Among the many things we have over at KelbyOne.com, including and up to that. I don't know where I was going with that. But I am Corey Barker, one of the Photoshop guys, and I'm joined today by, again, a man with no plan. Mr. And, Pete Collins. And that's how I like it, dang it. I don't even know what words are coming out of my mouth, so how can you? Good to be here, though, Corey. It's the way we go. It's the way we roll. All right, um, welcome back. We are going to dive right in. I've actually got something pretty cool. It's not in the book. Uh, what book is that, Corey? Hey, it's, no, it's not there. <laughs> hey, it's, there was that. All right, there's my pitch. No, actually, um, for once, I'm gonna actually do something 3D. I've gone two episodes without doing anything 3D, and I'm having withdrawals here. So if you'll bear with me and let me have my moment, we'll get through this together. Well, and I think All a right. lot of people are gonna like this one. Yeah, actually, I um, was playing around, and with the craze of Legos lately, in fact, I saw the movie a few weeks ago. Man, it was really good. I gotta say, it was a really fun, entertaining, great for kids, as well as adults, and I really enjoyed it. But it got me thinking. Can I create a Lego man in Photoshop using 3D? And the answer is, yes, you can. So I'm just going to show, I'm not going to create an entire Lego man in this episode. That would be a long show. But I just want to show you how you can kind of get started and how I got started and created mine. Now, what I did was I went on Google and just did an image search for Lego man blueprint. That's actually what I, <laughs> I, I typed in. And it returned a bunch of diagrams of these actual Lego men. Um, you've got a front uh, and profile, front and side view here, which is perfect when you're creating 3D models. So. In this document, you can see I've got the, um, the guy broken down, the, the head, the body, and everything like that, and the hands and everything. And certainly looks like they're simple enough shapes to be able to create in Photoshop pretty easy. So I'm going to show you how I did um, basically the head, because that's really the, kind of one of the cool parts. So right up here, I'm just going to zoom in, and I'm going to go and create a new uh, layer. And I'm going to use the pen tool. And the great thing is that this diagram actually has you know, a line right down the middle. So I, can, uh, I don't have to set a guide or anything like that. So I'm just going to go ahead and start and draw a line in the center of the head. Now, when you're creating the head, it's a rounded object, so we're going to revolve it. We're not going to do an extrusion, but rather a revolved object. So we only need to draw half the shape. So going over here, I'm just going to go and make that corner and then come down here. And I'm holding the shift key to hold down to keep my lines angular. But here I'm just going to click and drag and just give it a little bit of a curve. And I'm a little bit off the line, but that's OK. I'll just go down here and close out the shape. So there you can see I have half a Lego man head. So on that blank layer, what I'm gonna do is actually go ahead and just give it a color fill. We all know that the Legos are that base yellow color. So with that, go to go ahead and 3D, new 3D extrusion from selected path. And let's zoom out here so you can see it's extruded it, and this is what it does by default. It extrudes the object. Unfortunately, in Photoshop, which I'm still curious about, there is no straight feature that says revolve. You know, it's extruding and everything like that, which is, you know, an, an obvious, if you've ever worked in 3D, that's an obvious feature. So what you have to do is select the item here in the 3D panel. I'm going to bring up the properties panel. And we're going to go over, you've got these tabs at the top of the properties panel for deform, cap, things like that. We want to go to the deform section and right down here. So we're going to anchor it to the left side. That's where the flat side of this is. So on the deformation axis, we're going to check on this little white center on the left side there. Then go down to where it says horizontal angle and just drag it to the left all the way over. And that completes the overall shape. Now you'll notice there is that little hole in the top. You just got to simply drop the extrusion depth just a little bit to close that out. And there you have it. So let's reset to our default camera. Now obviously the front and back faces took on that yellow, but we obviously have the extrusion side. We're not seeing the sides anymore. We're just seeing the whole extrusion. So we'll select extrusion material, edit texture, just give that file a fill and that will wrap around the object. And that is how you go about starting to create your Lego <laughs> shapes. Now you just go through and observe the rest of the objects and create a new um, object for each element. Like for the chest here, I would create a simple extruded object. I would just trace the whole object. And then the arms got a little creative with that. Now I'm just going to kind of jump ahead and show you what ultimately resulted. Here's my, my own version of me as a Lego man. 
So I'm just going to move this around so you can see what's going on here. So this C, and you can see the head. Now, obviously, because of the way Photoshop applies textures, there's my face on both sides. But you're only seeing one side at a time, so it really doesn't matter. So you're saying you're two-faced, Corey. Yes, indeed. But notice, I'm selecting, I can select each of the individual elements and move them around. So if I wanted to you know, rotate the leg or something like that, <laughs> just, just kind of do that. So they're all individual 3D shapes, all completely merged together. So what I did was create a new layer for each individual item, then ultimately merge them all into a single 3D layer, but you still are able to manipulate the objects by themselves just by going in here and notice how I've got them all labeled here. And that's, that's another thing, that's another key here. Normally when I'm creating 3D, I'm not necessarily naming things. I have a bad habit of not naming layers and such like that. But here I wanted to be sure that I had um, whatever item I wanted to be working on. So here's the right hand. So you can, he's kind of grabbing his little pen there. So just a lot of fun you can have. Now once you've created your overall 3D Lego guy, then you can start to really have some fun with it. In fact, I was playing around with a number of different things. Here I'll show you a couple of things that I was playing around with. This is a... Uh, yeah, a couple of Lego guys. Oh, yep. yeah, see, they're <laughs> just kind of running through this Lego hallway, shooting at each other. All that done with Photoshop 3D. So once you've created the elements, then you can start putting them in positions and really having fun with a lot of uh, um, different ways of positioning them and such. And I'll show you as one last little treat. I showed Pete this a while ago. Uh, where did it go? Uh, where's my... I have to show you this because it was too cool. I only got to a certain point and then I was like, yeah, I'm done. But here are the Photoshop guys all presented as Lego men. Now, they're, of course, it's not done. I got to a point where I was just stopping, but you can see there we all are, you know. Can you pick out? I think the most obvious one is RC, of course, you know, because <laughs> his famous dork shirt and his Dunkin' coffee, he can't be without it, so. Of course, I'm going to do, be doing a, lot of bit more, a little bit more of uh, showing you how to create a fully realized Lego man. And I'm probably going to be putting that on the Kelby One site here in the near future. So Yeah, that would be great. I think a lot of people really like that for the kids, for themselves. Sure. It'll mm -hmm. be something fun to play with. All right. All right, I tell you what, we're going to take a quick break, and then we're going to come back, and I'm going to show you how to finish up the image that I've been working on for the past couple weeks. So we'll be right back. Cool. <laughs> Well, hi everyone, welcome back. Now, of course, we are looking forward to, in just a few weeks, Photoshop World is coming up in Atlanta, Georgia. We're all gonna be there. We couldn't be more excited to have a great time. It's, I don't know how many we've been to. We've been to, each of us has been to like, I don't know, 20? I was gonna say too many, but you really, that, that's not a good answer because mm -hmm. we love going every time. We both it, were going many times before we were on Oh, absolutely, staff. absolutely. Same energy level, even still today. So yep. It's a lot of fun. Be sure to check that out, photoshopworld.com. You can save $100 on the registration price if you register in just a few days by March 17th. So we only got sure. a couple days left, so make sure you jump on that. Check that out, of course. Now, moving right along, Mr. Pete, we are at part three of his vintage plane tutorials. So let's see what he's got to finish it off. All right, so I started off with this image from my good friend Larry. Uh, Larry Grace sent this to me, said, hey, what can you do with it? And I showed you how to cut it out, how to put the fake uh, propeller on it and put it on the background. If you haven't seen those, go back, check out the other episodes. And this is where we're headed, right here. This is the, the final image. Uh, of the plane, we've got the props, we got all that going on. But so today what I wanted to show you is kind of my tried and true method of adding different elements and putting it onto something like this textured background. So let's close all that out. And so I find a, whatever background I want to use, I've got a whole slew of paper backgrounds because I just love the texture. Plus they're kind of a neutral background that can show some of that texture through but not really wipe out the image that I'm laying on top. So I love the paper textures. And you can see here what I've done is I've actually cut out the paper from the background so it's on its own layer. And the reason why that's important is because I come in here and actually, I'm gonna get rid of this, and when I, uh, let's delete that, 
And so when I come in, I have the image that I'm laying over the top of this, and it's just set to normal, and that's how it is. Of course, it's showing a few extra things in there that uh, just ignore those. Those aren't part of the thing. But so what I do is I drop the image in, and then I immediately set it to multiply. And that does a pretty good job, especially since I have a black background. It really hides what's going on behind it, and so you don't have to do a lot here. But what I do is I come in and I hold my Command or Control button, and I click on the thumbnail of the paper, and it automatically loads the selection of the paper. So now what I can do is if I hold my Alt or Option button, and click on, I did that backwards, and I always do that. If you're like me, you can't remember when you hold the Alt or Option button, when you don't. So then I just sit, simply hit, <laughs> it still happens to me, too. undo. You know you do it, you're just like me, so I hit it, and what it's gonna do is it's gonna fill the outside with black and hide basically all the edges around the paper. But so the, the multiply looks pretty good, and, and you could stop right there, but this is the tip that I love to tell people to give it that extra little something to it, because here we go, it's at 100% and it's a little dark. I make a copy of that same image, and then I just simply change it, if it was at multiply like this, I simply change it to screen. And now what I have is I have two layers, one set to multiply, one set to screen, that I can adjust the opacity. There, that's at 100% opacity screen, but if I start dropping it down, it starts showing through more and more of the multiply uh, behind it. If it's too dark, I can drop the multiply down a little bit more to give it a faded look. I now have full control over what the final image and mixture of screen and multiply is. And so I, you'll see in all my layers, a lot of times when I'm doing this kind of work, that I'll have two layers, one set to multiply, one set to screen, all the time to give me the exact amount of detail I want with these cracks and creases and stuff like that. Then you can see I've, I've done one final thing here. I've grouped those two layers together and added a layer mask that I simply come in with my black paint brush set at maybe 30% and add some extra little things like I paint down the crack and the spine of this book and right over here to get rid of some of those elements to make it look like it really sets down on the paper. And then I've added these wonderful little stamps that I've gotten from Wikipedia, the public domain images that I've been able to find that match the, the time of that, and then some extra stamps that I've gotten as royalty free that I've used both uh, vector images and other stamps that I've made brushes in. And I simply do the same thing. I create a group of them, set it to multiply. Let me show you what it would look like if I set it to normal. That's how the stamps would look normal, set to multiply. They fade in there very nicely. And it's really just simply placing those in there, having them set up to the blending mode how you like it. And then finally, you can see right over here in this layer, I've taken my brush and a kind of grungy brush set to about 20% and gone in and started wearing down some of the stamps, especially on the edges and stuff, so they don't look quite as crisp and look like maybe they've been worn over time. The whole idea of doing all this is to make sure that it all looks like it's aged the same amount. And then finally, as I've showed you before, I take all that, group it together, and then I throw it over into Camera Raw. And let me show you that real quick. The final thing I like to do, filter Camera Raw as a filter, and I will maybe tweak, give it a little more clarity or something like that, but the main thing I do for this final thing is I go to my radial filter a new thing in Photoshop CC. I can now come along here, and what I'm gonna do is I'm, in essence, gonna focus the view right here on the plane. I can even spin it around a little, and now I've got control. I can lighten the outside or I can darken the outside. I can even drop the clarity a little bit on that, almost give it sort of a, a tilt shift look, but I'm using the radial blur, the radial filter here in Camera Raw to finalize my image. When I'm done, I hit OK. And so you'll see as soon as it finishes applying it, uh, there's before and there's after. It's just a little tweak, but it puts your eye right there on the plane and it really adds that extra little touch. So I love to use Camera Raw as a filter as kind of that finalize, add a little grain, a little bit of radio filter, and I'm finished and my image is all ready to go. So there you go. As Corey's reading his own book over there, uh, we're going to finish this up. We've got a couple things to talk to you about. Don't forget about the Peach Pit 
E-Deal. That's hard to say. We're going to do Picture Perfect Posting by Roberto posing. Valenzuela. Posing, not posting. Posing. Roberto Valenzuela. And uh, make sure you check it out at peachpit.com slash Kelby1. If you want the discount, put in the code Kelby1. All right. And you'll get a great deal on that book right there. And, of course, we're going to wrap things up with a giveaway. We're giving away another pass to Photoshop World. Mind you, it's only the conference pass. No flight or hotel. That's all up to you. But full conference pass to Photoshop World. Just go to kelby1.com slash contest. Go to Photoshop User TV, enter your name, email, and your name will be put in the hat for the grand Super Bowl of Photoshop events <laughs> Yep, in Atlanta. We'll hope to see you there. All right. Wraps up this week's episode of Photoshop User TV. I want to thank you, Mr. Pete, yep. for rounding out that trilogy of vintage plain awesomeness. All right. We hope to see you guys next time here on Photoshop User TV. I'm Corey Barker. Bye-bye. <laughs>